This has been a part of me for the past 20 years. And um, it, I'm telling everyone's story, um, everyone that went through this um, that day. Um, I was off that day on Tuesday, September 11, 2001. It was my day off and I was called into work at 4.30 in the morning. I worked for United Airlines and I was the in-flight coordinator, um, which means I, um, I checked in the crews, the flight attendants for their departures. Um, that day I checked in several flights um, that morning, very early in the morning. Um, I was at the airport about five o'clock in the morning that day. I checked in several crews and um, sent them off on their departures. And um, flight 93, um, the crew um, checked in with me and I spent some time with that crew. There were five flight attendants. Um, there were one that um, got put on the plane at the last minute because she was um, a reserve flight attendant. She was a new hire. And um, someone called in sick that day. Her name was Cece. So we had to put her on the plane that day. And um, she lost her life, unfortunately, on that plane that day. Um, the other flight attendants, um, Wanda, um, came in with heart palpitations and she thought about calling in sick that day. And um, we discussed it and she was gonna um, go to the doctor in San Francisco and see United's medical doctor in San Francisco. So she got on the flight that day. Um, I spent about a half hour talking to the crew on flight 90 for flight 93 that morning. Debbie, uh, one of the flight attendants for flight 93 was um, very excited that morning. She had just um, had a year free of melanoma and uh, she was really excited. She came behind the counter and gave me a big hug and she was so thrilled that day. Um, her melanoma was gone and um, we were excited. We were just reminiscing about her going through her skin cancer and stuff. And um, she was in a particularly good mood. And uh, Sandy, one of the flight attendants for Flight 93 was um, just coming back from maternity leave. She had just had her baby and her husband, Phil, was um, a pilot for US Air. And um, she talked about um, this being one of her last flights because she was decided to stay home with her baby. And um, it was all kind of bittersweet, you know, um, thinking about all of this after the plane crashed, you know, the conversations I had with these women um, before their flight. And um, I put this all in my book. I wrote a book about, um, I started journaling, you know, the day of 9-11, I started uh, journaling everything. And um, it's very dear to me. I, I uh, filled several journals and then I turned it into a book about my experience and um, everything that um, happened during 9-11 in the airport and uh, in the in-flight services office. Um, next thing happened was um, the flight left about 20 minutes late. Um, that's how they were able to call on the ground because the flight was delayed um, about 22 minutes. Um, the next thing I know, I was sitting at my desk and a Chicago flight attendant, I was still checking in flights. A Chicago flight attendant came running to my desk and she said, oh my God, a plane just hit the World Trade Center which she thought was the World Trade Center. And I said, what? And I ran to the crew lounge, which was next door. And um, she said, um, I said, that was the, that was the um, towers. And we watched in horror as um, the second plane hit the towers, which I saw was a United plane. And I ran back to my office and got my supervisor and we all you know scurried back to the crew lounge and we watched on tv um as um i think it was msnbc was showing it live um the, the planes were hitting the towers um before you know it the phones were ringing off the hook um they were going crazy um from the flight attendants were calling in wanting to know what planes had, had crashed um, the next thing I know, um, there was a call from Phil Bradshaw, Sandy's husband. And he said, Sandy had just called and said that um, 
their plane was being hijacked by four men with box cutters and red bandanas. And, um, and that call was just, um, just horrifying. Um, okay, let me um, just take a breath. <laughs> the call, um, you know, what do you say to a call like that? You know, we were just, it was horrifying. And um, so the calls proceeded to come in. I ran, we told the supervisor, um, before we knew it, there were um, terrorist task force agents in front of us at our desk. There were men with um, guns and dogs and um, these army guys standing in front of our desk. There was a bus in front of our, um, at, and the tarmac level was my office. It was the in-flight, um, we were at the in-flight um, services office, the onboard services office, and it was level with the tarmac. So they had pulled a bus up to evacuate all of the flight attendants out of the office. And um, they left us in the office. So the, the, the gentleman evacuated all of the flight attendants out of the office and we continued to take calls and they were expecting more hijack calls to come in. So these terrorist task force agents were putting up signs on what to ask when the, when the hijack calls came in. They wanted to know where everyone was located on the plane. And um, we found out with the next calls that came in, Sandy, Sandy was the one that called in next. Um, that um, Lorraine and Wanda were in fact ministering to passengers, which I thought was really beautiful. Um, they were in the back of the plane ministering to passengers and Sandy and Cece were so brave that they were um, in the back with Todd Beamer and um, uh, some other passengers, um, I believe were, um, they were, um, they had fire extinguishers and they were filling the um, passenger carts with, um, cans and Coke bottles and they were gonna bombard the cockpit. And um, I very vaguely remember any of the other calls, but um, I, I very vividly remember those calls, the one from Phil and the next one coming in. And then from that point on, um, there was, um, once the flight attendants were evacuated, um, we started looking up, well, I started looking up um, flights to see um, what, the, what the flights would show. And it, immediately it showed record secure. And normally when you look up a flight in the computer, you can pull up the, the flight attendant's names, who's on crew for that flight. Well, it showed for flight 93 records secure. And we knew, oh my God, this is really happening you know, you can't get into the records. So the FAA had put in records secure for that. So we knew that they were really being hijacked. This was really happening. So um, the next thing, um, Terry, the station manager made an announcement over the um, PA and said, all station managers report to the crisis center. So, we knew this wasn't good. So our manager, Linda, ran upstairs and all the managers went upstairs and left us at the desk to man the phones. They called someone from upstairs to help me man the phones. And the phones were ringing nonstop and it was all flight attendants calling in and flight attendants families calling in, but we didn't know anything at this point. And we were just answering the phones, just trying to calm people down. It was crazy. And um, I think um, at that point we were all in shock mode. We were just working, you know? Um, so um, Linda came back very shortly and she, uh, she, she called us all in the office and she said, um, okay, everyone, she turned off the phones. She said, flight 93 went down in, in a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Um, um, we had known the crew very well. Um, they had worked, it was the same crew that worked the flights, you know, the constant, the, the constant um, 
the same people worked the same flights all the time for years, you know? So we knew who was on the flights. Well, the phones came back to ringing again and we were ordered not to say what flight it was, not to speak to the press, not to um, mention the names who were on the flights, but people were calling in so frantically and they wanted to know um, what fam who was on the flights and they were guessing, was it Allison? Was it this one? Was it that one? And people were guessing. And even when I went home, you know, many, many hours later, I remember um, getting calls at home and flight attendants asking me, was so-and-so on this flight? Was so-and-so on the flight? And we couldn't, we couldn't acknowledge you know, we were we were told not to because the next of kins weren't located. So it was very, very difficult. Um, the next thing um, I remember was um, I kind of um, felt like a robot. You know, we were kind of in um, just like forward mode. You know, we just had to go forward. And um, I think we were all in shock at that point. You know, you're just kind of working. And um, the next thing I remember was, let's see, after the flight crashed, um, the calls started coming in and um, going, going um, the next day, the next day, um, well, the next couple days, um, they had Red Cross come into the office and um, they tried to, um, they had stopped all air travel. They stopped all air travel and flight attendants, once they started air travel again, all of our flights were landed in Canada and Canadians opened up their homes to many of our flight attendants. So we were trying to locate all of our flights for days. We were trying to locate all of our crews for days and the phones continued to ring. I remember working many, many hours for the next couple of days. And I remember when we evacuated, when we evacuated the flight attendants that day on 9-11, trying to locate my children. They were in three schools and we were so afraid, you know, like I remember a flight attendant saying to me when she evacuated, she said, oh my God, they called me Teresa. Oh my God, Teresa, they're gonna bomb Newark. They're gonna bomb the airport. And you know, it didn't really phase me because I was like in shock mode. I said, just locate my children, you know, get my children out of school for me, call my mother. And I wrote down the three kids school numbers. You know, I remember doing that. And um, my mother had my kids when I got home that night, my mother and her best friend. But we didn't go home till late that night. And I remember driving home on the turnpike and it was so eerie. But I, I do know that um, many hours going back on 9-11, um, after answering the phones for many hours, it had to be dusk at this point. The terrorist task force agents came downstairs and they called for me. And um, this other guy, Thomas, who was on the desk with me, and they asked to speak to us if they wanted to um, interrogate us, like interview us. So they walked us through the airport. It was the eeriest feeling I have ever had in my life and I'll never forget it. Walking through Newark airport and they had evacuated Newark airport at this point. It was probably sundown. And I remember walking through the airport and all she saw was dogs and terrorist task force agents everywhere with guns, these guys with guns, armed guys everywhere through the airport. And you look to the right with the big picture windows in the airport and you could just see the burning in New York, the, 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 the smoke. It was like in a movie. And they walked us upstairs to the crisis center, United Airlines um, VIP lounge where they were using as a crisis center. And they interrogated us for a long time. Um, for the calls that we took. And I'll never forget the terrorist task force agents named Jesse, and she was so wonderful to us. But um, I think we were in shock, you know, and, um, you know, um, we were up there for many, many hours. And then I drove home that night. My supervisor came up and got me from that office and walked me back down to my office. And I very um, vaguely remember driving home that night on the turnpike back to my home um, 
you know, and um, going back to work. And I continued to work for many days and many, many hours after 9-11. And it really, um, it really drastically affected me, but I continued to journal. And um, I, um, you know, um, there were a lot of security alerts. Once air travel started to pick up, there were many FAA security alerts about people putting bombs in zippers, in their zippers and, you know, um, FAA security alerts. Um, people are um, putting bombs in their zippers. People are putting bombs in their shoes. And the flight attendants were flipping out. They were so scared to fly. And the Red Cross came in and, um, and um, they were um, counseling our flight attendants. And many of them went out on sick leave. And then um, I sent emails. I sent a mass email to all the flight attendants and crews as to where they were during 9-11. And I got a lot of feedback and I put that all in my book. You know, um, so I, I, um, I'm glad I wrote about it because I had firsthand knowledge of everything and I'm glad I journaled everything, you know. And my book turned into being overcoming trauma and overcoming, um, you know, these hurdles. And um, I'm really glad I could tell my story today because I've been keeping this to myself for so many years. And um, I think it's important to share um, that you can overcome trauma. Um, Jan I continued to work until January 17th. And on January 17th, I did have a nervous breakdown. I, um, the trauma hit me, the shock wore off and the trauma set in. And um, I um, went on disability with United Airlines and Workman's Comp for many, many years. And um, I changed everything. My children were affected greatly by it. Um, I, um, my son had to go live with his dad and, um, you know, everything changed in my life. It really had a great impact on my life as it did many people's lives. Many people were affected. Um, this year, the 20th anniversary, I would like to go back to the crash site. Um, I would like to see it. Um, I know it's a beautiful site today and I would like to um, see the memorial. I'm hoping to overcome my fears and do that this year. Um, but um, I had a lot of love for the crew. Jason Dole and Leroy Homer were the uh, pilots. And um, I had a lot of love for um, the flight attendants that uh, were on that flight that day. And I really, um, you know, all the flight attendants that went through this with me, I had a lot of love for them. And I, I'm really grateful to tell my story today. And I thank you so much for giving me the time to share this message. Terry, when you say you had a nervous breakdown in January, what happened exactly? Oh, Shelly, I, um, I, I was working so many hours and, you know, I even, I was trying to cheer up the office. I helped plan funerals. We had a funeral of over 500 people for all the flight attendants that perished in the uh, flight 93 crash. And I assisted in, in that, um, we had it at the Sheridan in Newark and I assisted in planning that funeral. And I, I did so much work. I decorated the office for Christmas and everything. And I was just going on blind faith and energy. And I think I was in shock, you know? They all kept telling me, slow down, Terry, get some help, get some therapy. And I thought, no, I'm fine. And then January 17th, I was in my shower and um, I was getting ready to go to the airport. And my body just started trembling. I started crying uncontrollably and I blacked out. My mother found me naked in my living room and I was just unconscious. I just couldn't speak. And I was in such a bad state of mind. And they said it was such an emotional breakdown that the trauma wore off, that the shock wore off and the trauma set in. And it was pretty amazing. Like I'm really believing a God and you know, the doctor that they brought me to was a doctor, Frank Cancellari, and he was an ex-terrorist task force agent. And it was pretty amazing to me. He was a psychiatrist in Riverview Hospital. And um, it was a real blessing to me. And I've been in therapy all these years and um, I've really worked through it. I've worked through my trauma. I've been working very hard at getting better. 
And um, like I said, I, I was on workman's comp for many years with United, and now I'm on social security on a post-traumatic stress disorder. But um, I've come a long way. How do you deal with that kind of trauma when you say that you've worked through it? I can't even imagine how that is even possible. Well, I um, for years I wasn't able to talk about 9-11, Shelly. I really bottled it up and I, I, I didn't even share with my kids. Like my kids are gonna really be anxious to hear my story because I never really shared my story with my kids. They were 10, 12, 14 and 16 when 9-11 happened. And I never really had the chance to share with my kids exactly my involvement with 9-11. And my son Jason's listening today and I hope um, he gets some insight because, um, you know, he was greatly affected. My children were greatly affected by 9-11. I wasn't able to care for them. I went through depressions. I had really post-traumatic stress disorder. I was very sick. I went into addiction. I, um, I overcame addiction. I, um, so many things came up in my life through the past 20 years that I've overcome. And I've learned that I'm a survivor and I'm a fighter and um, I'm a strong woman. And I have a, I have a God that helps me through things. And um, I'm, I'm getting through this. Your sons didn't, you, you, you say you wrote a book though. They didn't read the book? No, because I still haven't um, published my book. Oh, uh, I have my book. Um, nobody's read my book. I, I kept it to myself and I've been working on it for all these years and I'm anxious to get it edited and published. I want to put it in a manuscript form and get it published. And I just needed some help with that. Well, I think this will be doing it. Jason is one son. How old was Jason at the time? Jason was 14. And your other son? My other son was 10 and he had to go live with his dad at the time because I was not capable of taking care of him. I was in such a state of depression. For how long? Years. Jason, do you want to jump on the video and are you, is, this is the first time you're hearing this? Um, I've heard bits and pieces uh, of the story, you know. Um, you know, I, I kind of have my own version in my head um, of what kind of went down. You know, without some of the details, you know, I've heard a lot of different, you know, over the years, you know, we have four, four family members, so we hear it different ways from each other, you know. Um, uh, as far as the whole story goes, I think, you know, from my perspective is right on the money, you know. Um, I know that my mom was an onboard service coordinator. I know that, um, you know, that one of her friends was sick and that she had to take that friend off and she had to replace someone on short notice. Um, I know that there were some sort of conversations on a phone where, um, you know, I, I don't know if it was whether the police, FBI, whoever it was, her, her, her direct boss, whoever had, she had to speak to, um, as far as what was going on. I know there was a lot of chaos and hectic moments and late nights and things like that. Um, and I know there was a lot of depression that followed, you know, and um, certainly affected us as a family. Um, and without going into further detail, you know, it, it it was a long road, a long road ahead. And I think, you know, it was a struggle for everyone in our family. Um, I'm happy that my mom's doing well, happy that she's, you know, she's, she is really doing great. She's uh, standing her own, she's standing on her own two feet again. So that's, that's the most important thing for me and our family. I think uh, we're all, we're all proud of her and where she's at. And uh you know, I think that's kind of where I'm at. You know, if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. What do you remember from that day, Jason? Well, I remember I was in my um, my teacher, Miss Brinster's class. Um, I remember getting called down to the main office. I was the first kid in the school to know before anyone, uh, aside from the secretaries, because I guess my mom called. Um, or I don't know who called that at that time. Somebody reached out to us at the time. And um, I remember going down to the main office and getting the message that, you know, the Trade Center had been hit and, and uh, the Twin Towers had been hit, I'm sorry. And um, 
when I returned back to my class, when I was walking back to my classroom, um, as I walked down the hallways, all the TVs were turning on and people were in like shock and all people were in the hallways. Uh, people just began to get the message of what was going on. Um, so every, every TV in the whole school was turned on to news and was watching the, the actions unfold now. To understand where we grew up is a, is a small town called Kingsburg and uh, it's a, directly across from the city. And um, when that began to happen, when we, when we got out of school, there was probably about 100 kids that went down to what we call the Baywalk. And um, we saw the bellowing smoke over top of the, uh, over top of the bay. And it was just constant for days and days and days where you can just see smoke all over the place. Um, so it, it was pretty tough, especially in our, in our area. We have a lot of like uh, firemen and police and all that that assisted in the efforts. And I, you know, I know personal friends that have, you know, their fathers have lost their lives, firemen and police officers from cancer and things like that um, throughout the, the years. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of what my recollection of it was, you know, me and my sister were in school together. My older sister were in school together. So we kind of linked up and I, I think we ended up going home early that day. Um, and uh, just kind of were together, you know, went for mom to get home. I, I was with my grandmother at the time. Um, and, and at what point did you realize that your mom had checked in the crew that was on flight 93? I think that was until a few days later. You know, until so we kind of everything kind of not settled down, but everything well, she was able to get home and, and, you know, trying to be home with us and things like that. And then we had a better understanding of what was going on. Um, I knew that because I've been in her job a lot. We used to travel a lot and um, I, I, I knew where her office was and I knew what she did. Um, so she had this little desk. It was like a high top, high top desk. And I guess um, almost like like chest width, you know, like I, well, my chest height, I guess at the time I was a little bit shorter um and it kind of sat above and then all the, there was a room in the back i think and there was always a secure door when you walk in so it was a secure door a little lobby and then there was a couple couple computers there with a, a back room and i remember um going in there a few times so from my memory and my imagination you know uh, i'm i'm thinking about these flight attendants coming in her having to go and link them in the computer and then send them off into the airport onto their flight so that's kind of how i remember it um it's hard to look back and for me and to remember those things because it wasn't ex for for her it was very significant for me it was you know a part of my life that was just another piece of the puzzle you know it's kind of we did have a, a tough tough life tough upbringing and you know the onset of all this and you know as my mom said her, you know her addiction and and then now to her recovery it's been a long road so it's been a lot of uh, different types of trauma in, in our lives um and I'm not going to pretend that it was any of it was easy. Um, very difficult time. Um, yeah, so. Terry, you had two sons and one daughter. You have two sons and one daughter. Two daughters and two sons. Oh, two daughters and two sons. Okay. How many years were you paralyzed by this? Um, up until two years ago. Wow. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Thank you, Shelly. Is there anything else you want to add, Jason yeah. or Terry? I just feel so blessed that I'm able to be here and um, tell my story. And I just feel, I feel such healing telling this story today. I really do. And um, I feel so blessed that my kids are in my life and um, we have found peace from all this wreckage. And um, I, I just feel so blessed today. And um, I hope the families, you know, all those little kids that grew up without their mothers, because all the flight attendants were women, you know, and I hope these children are doing well today. And um, Leroy and Jason, the, the pilots, you know, everybody, because you always hear about um, the victims of the towers you know, in New York, but you never talk about Shanksville. Anyone never talks about Shanksville and flight 93 and the other flights. And um, they were very dear to my heart, but I'm so grateful and I'm so honored that you um, chose to do an interview with me, Shelly. Well, I'm just so honored that you chose this forum to share your story and uh, bless and uh, 
Yes, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.